Hello everyone and thanks for joining us on Encore, coming up on today's show. Pablo Picasso was always evasive when asked about his influences. However, the artist's black period was undeniably drawn from his fascination with African art. Those canvases and more are on display at the Picasso Primitive Exhibition in Paris, a celebration of the painter's passion for far-flung cultures. For centuries, this island on the outskirts of Paris was the site of a massive car factory, but now it's changed gears. Bob Dylan is set to perform at a new performance complex, turning the industrial zone into a cultural hub. Oh, 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 please, we ain't got no peace because we spent all our money Taking inspiration from, from personal oh, hardships, no Loyal Kana's brand of confessional hip hop has catapulted the British artist into the realms of the great storytellers of rap. Picasso's paintings went from blue monochromes to rose hues before he went searching for something more. And he found it in African art. In the spring of 1907, Picasso was visiting the apartment of American writer Gertrude Stein in Paris when Henri Matisse stopped by with an African sculpture. And so began a period of exploration known as the Black Period. The Picasso Primitive Exhibition is running at the Quai Branly Museum in Paris until July 23rd, showcasing Picasso's lifelong admiration for art from different parts of the world. Fanny Allard and Simon Harding have the story. For many years, his art was classified as Cubist or even part of the Surrealism movement. However, Picasso's work was varied and above all modern. Inside the halls of the Quai Branly, the Spanish maestro unveils an African touch. Masks, sculptures, models, which all came from a continent that was once deemed isolated, but which were methodically collected by Picasso. He undoubtedly gave them an importance which took us a long time to figure out, but which we can today see in a museum dedicated to these primitive art forms. I think if Pablo Picasso is displayed in this museum for a few months, he deserves it, because he truly grasped the importance of this art before anyone else. His work's an ensemble, and he's the only one who never talked about a period. Like he ironically said, the black arts don't know. Picasso discovered primitive art by chance when he visited a museum in Trocadero. At the time, during the Universal Exhibition at the beginning of the last century, primitivism was considered as exotic, a colonial art. Black art was a term used to describe anything which wasn't Western. But the Spaniard became enchanted by the style, which followed him into his very own workshop. Refusing to talk about influences, he will say that his themes were inspired by these primitive works ranging from death to sexuality. It's above all about the meeting of African and Oceanian art with Picasso, a meeting through these pieces of art. The message shown through this exhibition is that even though they never met, they understood each other. During a period where everyone believed that the point of art is to be beautiful, Picasso explored the unconventional. At the Quai Branly, a century later, he nevertheless managed to achieve beauty. For almost a century, Séguin, a small island on the Seine just outside of Paris, was the site of a massive automotive factory. The industrial zone is getting a cultural makeover. From a cacophony of car parts on a factory line to songs of leading parts in a full-scale musical production. A giant performance complex is taking over the island and it's about to stage its very first show. Anka Ule reports. A temple of music in the middle of the sun. Glass, solar panels and advanced technology make this building one of a kind. 36,500 square meters dedicated to all genres of music. 
sitting right on top of what used to be a Renault factory, the space is called La Scène Musicale. And this is what it will look like. The site itself is an architectural wonder. Designers only had a space of 350 meters by 100 meters to work with. And that space needed to fit two full concert halls. In order to do that, architects came up with a streamlined design resembling a cruise liner floating on the river. But this ship doesn't run on steam. Instead, 800 square meters of solar panels make up a sail. It's supported by a metal beam that follows the sun throughout the day and provides part of the complex's electricity. Inside the sphere, the auditorium is designed to optimize acoustics. The idea is to take away the microphone. That means a singer can be heard the same all the way up in the balcony seats, as well as the very front row. The wooden walls of the auditorium feature indentations that allow the sound to bounce around the room giving the audience the impression of being right in the middle of the orchestra. The seatbacks have waves built in to absorb the noise made by spectators. And the remote-controlled stage places the musicians in an optimal position. Long gone are the days of automaking on Il Seguin, giving way to the cultural capital of the future. On top of the concert halls, the complex will feature boutiques and rehearsal rooms, a veritable powerhouse of music and culture. And Bob Dylan is set to perform there on the 21st of April. He could surprise with music off his latest triple album, Triplicate, and he'll officially be a Nobel Prize recipient after he picks up the award in Stockholm this weekend. For more, join us again on Monday for the music show. Now, Bob Dylan will no doubt be celebrating the anniversary of a genre that's grown to become a big part of his repertoire. 100 years ago last month, five New Orleans musicians cut the first recording of a new genre of music unknown to the U.S., selling more than one million copies. Shanam Santier brings you the story of the first commercial jazz record. The sound of jazz had already evolved for a decade before it was first recorded. It was in 1917 that the original Dixieland jazz band registered a 2 minute 37 second tune. Recording techniques were primitive at the time, but the muffled sounds offered a charm of their own, especially for a new genre of music. This band is a bit like when punk first came out, or when the Beatles first made it to the US in 1964. It was a revolution. Young people went crazy about it, and older people thought it was a mess. By 1917, the jazz craze was in full swing in New York's clubs. But on desk, it was Enrico Caruso, an Italian operatic tenor, who stole the show. His songs would fill many a living room. And then one evening, in a Manhattan restaurant, the quintet, Dixieland Jazz Band, were spotted by producers. A few days later, they were recording the first ever jazz desk, a white band recording black music during a period of entrenched white racism. Record companies were controlled by white people, and I think that unfortunately, at the time, it was a rather natural move to turn to those musicians. Record companies all wanted to have their own jazz bands. It was the beginning of a big trend, and we can say that this band was at its forefront. The great history of jazz, which was first recorded in 1917, was also brought to France along with US troops. Now to a musician who's channeling his own hardships into his brand of confessional hip-hop. Loyal Kana sat down with France 24 during a Paris stopover of his world tour. Take a look. Personal stories of hardship are a rapper's trademark, but few tell as much as and as soon as Loyal Kana. It's part of what is gaining the 22-year-old a sizable following and tens of thousands of views on YouTube. He's known that he's different for a long time, in part thanks to ADHD, which he was diagnosed with and bullied for as a child. Music is um, 
is, is, is something that really, really calms me down. Because I've got ADHD, I'm very impulsive. But when I write stuff down, that's actually like what I really want to say or what I really mean to say. So I think kind of the truest or the most honest I'm, or kind of accurate to myself I've ever been is when, I, when I'm writing stuff down. At Paris's Badaboom Club in February, Loyal Karna showed that he has just as much passion when performing as when writing. He's also out to promote his debut album, Yesterday's Gone, which was released earlier this year. There's a bit of a story. Can I tell you the story really quickly? That's the tale of how at 19 he lost the only father figure in his life, his stepdad. That's my fing dad. Oh, of course I'm fing sad. Yo, I miss my dad. Shortly after, he wrote a song about him called Cantona. She was rubbing by my health, was rubbing it was good. They said, like, ooh, ah. I said, ooh, ah. Since I knew what football was, I've been a Liverpool fan. But my dad was a Man Manchester United fan, and his hero was Cantona. I wrote this song about my dad, and because my dad was my hero, it made sense to kind of name it after his hero. Karna's repertoire includes songs about lighter subjects too, like text messages and girls. Yeah, I just want to get a nice house in a quiet place and a big dog. Um, and yeah, fall in love, which I'm trying to do at the moment. Next up for Karna is an international tour which includes gigs in Switzerland, Australia and the US. That's all we've got time for. I hope you've enjoyed the show. We're going to leave you with a track of Kendrick Lamar's highly anticipated new album, which is expected to drop on April 7th. Humble is the rapper's second song release this week following The Heart Part 4. Remember our website, connect with us on social media and do stick around. There's more news coming up on France 24. This is Humble. Bitch, sit down. Me humble. Sit down.